Okay. I'm a little nervous now because I don't want to waste another 25 minutes. Um, It'll be okay. Huh? It's okay. Good morning, church family. Uh, this morning, we're going to extend this series of messages entitled, May Those Who Follow Find Us Faithful. Uh, because honestly, church family, I, I think we are living in a time where faithfulness can be more easily measured, don't you? And those who follow, those that are watching us, well, it's going to be a lot easier for them to see what it is that we believe. I pray it be faith. Jesus said, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And of course, we know the answer is no. Likewise, he says, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Now, with that truth in mind, church family, let us all pray together this one sentence prayer. I'll pray and then, and then we'll bless it together. Um, Lord Jesus, may those who follow find us faithful. And all God's people said, amen. All right. Okay. So today's message is there is good news for those who fear. Okay. And I know that's a bit of an odd title, but we kind of need to maintain our sense of humor in times like this. Anyway, about a week ago, a week ago Saturday to be precise, one of our adult children was at the Walmart store to pick up some groceries when all of a sudden there was a disturbance at the other end of the store. Okay. One of the workers had just rolled out a pallet of merchandise out of the, the back storage area. Uh, and, and, and I think is, I don't know what aisle it was, uh, maybe aisle 12, you know, and, and he was mobbed by a bunch of customers who began rummaging through the boxes, tearing a few open to claim the contents within, and I think their valued treasure is like dishwashing liquid, you know, which, but, but that event kind of raises a question, and the question is, what caused what I suppose to be everyday normal folks to turn into what looked like to observers standing nearby, marauders in a raiding party right there in aisle 12? Well, we all know the answer to that question, don't we? And the answer is fear, fear, which raises the question for us today, church family, what situations in life cause you and I to fear? What level of crisis does it take for us to go a little or maybe a lot crazy? Okay. You know, a few weeks ago, a lot of the answers to that question would have been probably less tragic. Okay. Maybe you were fearful you would fail a class or maybe you were fearful you'd not find a prom date or, or you, you'd not find that special person in your life or get that promotion in the workplace. Okay. But now the answers to that question, what causes you fear might be a little different and a lot more significant. Not that any of those answers weren't on the minds of some folks a few months ago, but now those same concerns are a lot more prevalent, okay? Concerns of, could I lose my job? Will I ever be able to retire? Will my 401k ever return to its prior glory? Could I lose my health or worse? Now, I asked those same questions in a sermon about nine years ago, and, 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 and uh, most of us heard those questions, and we nodded our heads in agreement, recognizing that they were true, and then we let them pass by. But today, I'm guessing we'll ponder them just a little longer, a little longer. But the point is, those scenarios have always been there among us, okay? But now, like a raiding party at the end of aisle 12 in your local grocery store, the situation, well, it has our attention. And for there are a multitude of scenarios that can bring turmoil into our lives and cause us to fear. Because on any given day, any season of life, all kinds of scenarios begin to run through our minds. And these things, these things that run wild in our minds, okay, they create chaos and panic in our lives. And we get caught up in them, okay? And then fear, who is the enemy of the mind and soul, will try to creep in. I mean, if we were honest, church family, we know, we know it's a battle that we are now engaged in. I mean, it happens. Sometimes we fear the chaos. These are the storms of life. Now, most storms cause a certain amount of concern in our lives, while others, if we get personally caught out in them, well, a deep fear threatens to creep in. I mean, it just naturally happens, doesn't it? 
Well, I have good news. Our text for today is a text that's a very familiar one to many. Uh, We find it in Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25, which deals with the storms of life uh, 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 and where we can find our peace. Okay, And in this event of Jesus and his disciples, who are also his friends, well, it takes place on a day and time when they all together get caught out on the Sea of Galilee. uh, And it's not just a storm, but a furious storm comes in upon them. So let's look at the event recorded for us and then be reminded of some of the life lessons on how we as Christ fathers can weather the storms of life. Now, so let's begin. In Luke chapter 8, uh, verses 22 through 25, we read this. It says, One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got in the boat and they set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked the disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. So, the first lesson we can draw out of this event in the life of Jesus and his disciples is the storm can turn the calm into chaos okay anyone who's been to the toilet paper aisle the last few weeks okay knows this one right after a long day's work who wants to go in there and even try to fight that storm right okay fight that crap i mean that's how it was for jesus because this event comes at the end of a long stress-filled day because on that day things in fact turn from calm to chaos in jesus world from peace to perplexity one commentator wrote on this passage saying that before morning becomes evening jesus will have reason to weep run curse praise and doubt and within minutes his world will be turned upside down for on this day he will hear of his cousin john the baptist's death and he will hear reports from his returning disciples reports of them preaching proclaiming the gospel healing the sick casting out demons and they they were pretty excited about it all but that there was little time to celebrate because moments later the huge crowd arrives they had followed the disciples and found Jesus you know and, and these massive crowds you know how it is everybody wants a touch everybody wants a piece of Jesus so finally Jesus decides he needs to get away for a while he's tired and he needs some rest and so he tells the disciples come on let's go over to the other side of the lake so they get in the boat and they start out for the other side and Jesus lays down to take a nap and do you know why church family <laughs> because he's tired and he needs a nap, right? I mean, the point is, even Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, needs to eat, drink, and once in a while, sleep. Now, many of you know how the story goes. Jesus is sleeping, the disciples are manning the boat when a squall comes down on the lake, okay? Mark in his gospel says it's a furious squall that came up, okay? Bible scholars have noted that 20-foot waves are possible in the Sea of Galilee. Now, I've been caught out on a lake when a severe storm came up, and usually, you know, how it works is the wind picks up a little, and then the waves a little, and you can kind of sense that there's a storm. I mean, it's enough to get your attention that a storm is working itself up. But if you've been out before, you know, it's not so much that it concerns you, I don't think, but no, sooner do you think that, that this isn't such a big deal, the storm is then on you. And then even the most experienced among us are panicked, especially in aisle 12 of the grocery store. I mean, some say, no, no, not these guys. But let me ask you, Peter, James, and John, they were experienced boatsmen, right? Tell me, church family, I mean, they were fishermen. Were they not? Yes, they were. They, they, were, they were seasoned, okay? But did they get panicked? Did they panic? They sure did. They sure did. So you can imagine Matthew, the tax collector. I mean, I imagine his knees are knocking, okay? So what did they do? Well, if you're in a furious squall and Jesus is in your boat sleeping, what would you do, right? Yeah, you go wake Jesus up, right? And so that's what the disciples did. And they said, Master, Master, we're all going to drown, you know? I mean, this reads like a thunderstorm that hits our homes sometimes, you know, late at night with the children in the home. They're in their beds, all tucked in safe and sound, sleeping like babies, and you're in yours, okay? And when that nasty thunderstorm storm blows in the first blast and crash well nothing happens they hold fast in their beds but that second blast and crash where the windows vibrate bam those little footsies hit the floor then bam bam you know your bedroom door flies open and before the rumbling even stops they're in your bed why why church family why into your bed because they know they know your bed is the safe place right they're safe they're in your bed But these are grown men, right? 
tough season, men's men, right? Nope, not this time. Because bam, bam, and these grown men come crashing in on Jesus, all panicked by the storm. And so Jesus gets up and he speaks a word. He rebukes the storm and that's it. The wind stops and the seas are calm. You know, uh, my iPad uh, uh, has a woman's voice that talks to me uh, occasionally uh, by accident, okay? I mean, I don't know her name. I assume she's maybe Siri or Maggie or I don't know who she is. But whenever I turn on my iPad a certain way, I do it wrong, you know, and she comes on and it asks, and she asks, how can I help you? And my instant reply is always the same. I just say, go away. And she always responds with, okay, and then she's gone and my world of peace is restored. But let me tell you, church family, that's about the limit of my calming powers. How about you? How about you? What kind of storms have you been out in? A storm out on the lake or the sea? A storm of a broken relationship or a financial crisis or a chaotic situation at work? What kind of experience do you have? Are you a seasoned uh, boatsman? Well, whatever it is, uh, regardless of what it was, when a squall comes, a furious one, check your pulse. Check your stress level, and you probably have found it's going up a little, or a lot, okay? Because in that moment, the calm turns into chaos, because in a furious squall, it almost always does. It's just the natural human reaction that the storm can turn the calm into chaos. It just does. Now, here's the thing. People have a tendency to handle those big storms differently. Some people totally lose it and they run into your boat or your room and they scream, wake up, there's a storm. You know, uh, Those are your aisle 12 folks, right? Pure panic, okay? Others are a little more civil. They just go uh, every day to aisle 12, okay? And they acknowledge that there's a storm, but they don't scream about it, but they're still there, right there in aisle 12, aren't they? There are still others. They insist rather fervently. I wasn't scared. But now that you're up, Jesus, and we're all in dial 12, could you do something? Truth is, deep down, they've all visited aisle 12 because they're all, to some degree, panicked by the storm. You know how I know? Because this passage, it doesn't say it doesn't say that it was Peter, okay? I mean, Peter's always the impulsive one, right? He's the, he's the leader of the bunch. Or Matthew, who had no sea experience that we know of at all. It wasn't him either. No, the passage says it was the disciples, like all of them, that screamed, Master, wake up, there's a furious storm, and we're all about to drown. Yeah, I, I, I think deep down, regardless of temperament, they're all panicked, and so they all run to Jesus, which is a pretty good idea. And here's why, church family, and you can write this down, because Jesus can turn panic into peace. Jesus can turn our panic into peace. In a word, Jesus rebukes the wind and the raging waters, and it's all calm. Peace, be still, right? Can you imagine that? Can you visualize that? There was this complete silence, this complete calm. So how does that work, you may ask? Because we all know that's, that's just not natural, okay? Because usually a storm has to first intensify and then rage and then slowly it'll subside and then after it moves off, and then there's calm. How is it possible to calm nature storms in an instant? Well, Jesus has authority over nature. So visualize in your mind you're in a storm, church family. That shouldn't be hard to do. You're in this ferocious storm and within you there is this sense of panic you know aisle 12 kind of panic and then jesus cries out peace be still and there is this complete silence this complete calm and in that moment everything and everybody just stops even those in aisle 12 And for just that brief moment, everyone there is just amazed, completely stunned. I imagine like a game of freeze tag when you're a kid, you know. Can you visualize that, church family? Because that's the description of the disciples in verse 25. The word amazement just kind of jumps off the page, okay? For in that moment when they all thought, surely we're all going to drown, now they sit in complete silence and calm in total amazement total amazement. Now, the word amazement, I don't know if you noticed this, church family, that's not the only word used to describe the disciples' reaction. For there's two words mentioned there, and amazement is the second word. Do you know what the first word was? You can speak to me. I can hear you, you know. 
So, what's the first word to describe the disciples' reaction to the complete calm of the storm, church family? Speak to me. That's right. The word is fear. They were afraid, but not of the storm. And then they said, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Now, I get the disciples' reaction, fear. Fear mixed with amazement, okay? And I think if we were in the boat with Jesus, and when he calmed the storm, we would have responded exactly the same way. Fear and amazement. I mean, it seems natural enough, so no problem. I mean, when I look at this whole event, I'm going like, yeah, we're good. I mean, I'd have done the same, okay? But not Jesus. <laughs> not Jesus. Jesus has a problem with them, okay? And he rebukes them for it. He takes his disciples to task, if you will. He says, and, and we probably ought to listen to this close church family. He says, where is your faith? For they feared the storm. Now, that's our recorded event, okay, for today. And within that event, we see two responses. And within those two responses, we find our third lesson, which is after the calming of the storm, our fear of the storm, it turns to fear of God. Okay, to fear of God. The point is, there are two kinds of fear. Now, the first kind of fear is a healthy fear, okay? You know, I once knew a father, you know, a good old boy from the mountains of Pennsylvania back home. I really respected this guy. He was a good father, good Christian man, and he had a daughter. And every time his daughter brought a new boy home right after she introduced the boy to her father, her father introduced the boy to his enclosed porch just off the kitchen. For just outside the kitchen, uh, beyond that door, was a shovel. And he'd say, now, son, I know how to use that shovel, and I own six acres out back. So if, if I were you, I'd be respectful of my daughter. Now, I don't recommend anyone try that at home, and that old boy didn't really mean it. I mean, not completely, okay? But when you're a 16-year-old and you're meeting your date's father for the first time, I think fear and amazement are words that are fitting, okay? I mean, that's fear of God type stuff. And a fear of God, the Bible says, is the beginning of a lot of good stuff. In other words, it's healthy. And then there's the second kind of fear, and this is an unhealthy fear, okay? And this is the kind of fear that the disciples had, and that causes Jesus to rebuke them, because this is the kind of fear that's not only unhealthy, but it's a lack of faith. Now, why is it a lack of faith, you may ask, Mark? I mean, it's natural, right, to, to be concerned with a furious storm like that. Didn't you say that? Okay, yes, I did. Well, not, but not when you have Jesus in the boat. Not when you have Jesus in the boat with you. And, and he had already said, to his disciples, let's go to the other side of the lake. Let's go. You see, it's not as much a lack of faith because they are concerned about storms or that storm. It was a lack of faith. You know, it was because of the lack of faith that they did not hold to the promise that Jesus had given that we're, we're going to the other side. Okay? But take notice of how that fear shifts. When Jesus is by their side, whose presence, by the way, changes our perspective, okay? For they were transformed from fear of the storm to amazement and fear of Jesus. Now, that's a concept most people don't equate to Jesus for these days. I mean, love Jesus, sure. Respect Jesus, absolutely. But fear Jesus, really? Why would we fear Jesus? Because he's God in the flesh. That's why. Because he's empowered by the Spirit. When he was empowered by the Spirit, he, was great. he had a greater power than any earthly storm that you'd ever encounter. That's why. I think Jesus says it best for our current situation in Matthew 10, 28 through 31, when he puts it into real clear terms, okay? He says this, he says, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but like storms, you know, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. And of course, that's God. That's God's to do, for God judges our eternal destiny, okay? But Jesus goes on, he says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet none of them falls to the ground apart from the will of the Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And Jesus' point is, so you don't need to be afraid. There's no need to be afraid, for you are worth more than many sparrows, he says. Now, that's a passage that should bring all of us a great deal of comfort. Because Jesus is concerned for us. I mean, he who has authority over the storms of the earth cares for us. And yet, if we're not careful, we'll be controlled by fear. We'll be controlled by fear. A lesson than the disciples who were very clearly close friends of Jesus, been following his teachings for a long time, and yet it's a lesson they didn't fully understand until Jesus calms the storm of their life by simply saying, peace, be still. 
Now, I kind of said this earlier, but there are all kinds of ways to respond to storms like this, okay, life storms. Different personalities respond differently. Some withdraw or hide out. Others come out fighting and they get kind of violent or loud. You know, others still attack verbally and they pick, pick, pick. Sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle jabs, you know. Some just get quiet and hope that it all soon passes. But the best thing you can do in the midst of a storm, a ferocious storm, is turn to Jesus. Because the truth is, he can astonish and amaze you. And he can calm your storm. You only need to trust in him. Now, with that said, I'd be remiss if I didn't add this. Because there's another truth that we need to understand. And that is, just because Jesus can calm the storms of life, it doesn't mean that he will. Okay? And I know that's a very hard teaching. But nevertheless, Jesus is the one we should always turn to. Peter was asked by Jesus after just such a hard teaching, basically, Peter, are you going to turn away like all the others and leave me? Peter very wisely replied, and you can find this in John 6, 68. He said, Lord, to whom would we go? For you, and he means you alone, for you have the words of life. Now, if we understand that Jesus is the one to whom we must go to to have life, whether it be now or forever in eternity, Like Peter, that should be reason enough to trust in Jesus. But there are other reasons as well. First, Jesus is never afraid. The Bible tells us perfect love cast out fear. Jesus had and was and gives perfect love. What a great person to have in your boat when trouble arises. A person has no fear, someone who's seen it all before and is confident in the outcome. The second reason we should turn to Jesus is because he has the power to overcome any any storm. And and, in Mark 10, 27, the Bible says not that all things are possible for men, but that with God all things are possible. Now, it's a long theological discussion to explain to folks uh, why bad things happen to good people, okay? Uh, uh, Which happens in storms, okay? But, I mean, you have to go back to the very beginning, uh, man's fall from grace, but the answer lies in one word, okay? And the word is love, okay? God loves us, therefore he gives us choice. The choice to receive love and the choice to give love back. And with choice came sin, and with sin came corruption, disease, and disaster, and death. Now, God could have prevented all that, but then the choice of love would have gone away with it as well. But the good news is, God is the master of turning bad into good. So in other words, God can take the storms of our lives and use them to strengthen that love. Okay, and and because those storms, if we will allow them, and we need to hear this, church family, those storms, they can teach us to turn to him and they can teach us to depend on him. Someone once said, as people of the storm, we should remember that without the rain and the storm, there can be no rainbows. The third reason to turn to Jesus is that Jesus is always with us. Jesus' parting words with his disciples after his resurrection, but before his ascension, you know, was this. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he gave them the church's mission statement to go make disciples and equip the church family. Okay. And then he told them, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Years ago, uh, leading my first uh, short-term mission project team, uh, it was a team of 31 youth and adults to the mountains of the Dominican Republic, and we were about to make the last leg of, of air travel from Miami to the Dominican, and I had I had the sole electronic ticket that the, the, the travel agency had given us, you know, and, and, and the airline wouldn't recognize it, and so I stood there for two hours trying to work it all out to no avail. When the time for the boarding was called, I told the team, which was mostly youth, but it also included my wife and two youngest daughters, I said, go ahead and board, and I instructed to the other adult leaders to watch over them. I said, go ahead and board. I'll be there in just a minute. So I stood there, okay, trying to work things out with the airline supervisor and we called the travel agent, but they weren't, we weren't getting a hold of them. You know, they booked the tickets and, you know, we, we checked the plane's manifest and I was on it, but it still, it showed the ticket was invalid. And all the while the clock's ticking, tick, 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 you know. Well, with five minutes to go, everyone's in a panic. The team is now on the plane. I said, go ahead. They got on the plane. I'm standing there at the counter and now the plane is prepared to depart. Finally, with literally just minutes to go, I was say, I said, what's the problem? And he says, well, we don't have payment for the ticket. And I said, can I pay? And he said, yeah. And so we did. Praise Jesus. And what a relief. But here's the thing. The whole time I was stuck at the ticket counter, a friend of mine named Bob Ellis, the elder on the trip, whose job I'm sure was to watch over us all, stood right there at the counter with me. 
Several times I implored Bob. I said, Bob, go ahead and board the plane. I'll be along. Bob, go ahead. Get on the plane. I got this. Each time, the same reply. He said, when you go, I'll go. I said, but Bob, I don't, I, if I don't make the plane, you're going to need to help lead the others lead. He said, others can lead, but we'll make it. The matter of the fact was that no matter what I said, Bob was going to be like Jesus. He was going to be my Jesus and not leave me alone. And you know what? Deep down inside, I was so very glad for it. Because here's the thing. While on the outside, as the leader, I tried to appear strong and confident. But the truth is, on the inside, I was fearful the whole thing was going to go bad. But Bob's never leaving me. His presence beside me brought me peace. Which leads us right into our last reason. The reason we as Christ followers turn to Jesus during storms of life, furious storms of life, is because Jesus, he's our Prince of Peace. He's our anchor in the storm. The Apostle Paul, who weathered his share of furious storms in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, wrote these words of assurance, I think, that speak to us today, Christ followers. He said this, he said, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. What was that? Okay, you're going to have to cut. It's still running.